Hello, and thank you, listeners. My name is Luke Mardigan, and you are listening to Be Insured, where we talk about business, leadership, and insurance. That way, on your worst day, when you need it the most, you will be insured. So uh, there I was, three years in the business, crushing uh, crushing it, moving along, crushing all our goals and metrics. And we hit the tipping point, and everyone on our team knew it. And that's just when I caught wind that my very best team member was considering leaving. Leaving? Why? We're doing so well. I just need everyone to keep doing the same thing. The stuff that got us here. That's what I told myself. But is that what my key employee wanted the most? Are your best performers okay with staying where they are? How do you stop them from leaving? That is our conversation today. And I am joined with some amazing guests, including my co-host, Eric Gastring with the Martigan Agency. Tom Hamp, business coach with Advocoach of Bend, Michigan. David McNeely, financial advisor at Castle Financial Partners. So, Tom, uh, you are a business coach. Do most of your clients know who their key employees are, or is this something you're pointing out to them? Um, it's kind of a, uh, the, the answer for that is kind of mixed. Um, yes, most of them do. Um, but I usually, when I have a client, I, I do ask them the question, who do you think is your most important employee? And most of them get it wrong. Um, the <laughs> owner is the most important employee. Cause if they went away for the most part, there wouldn't be a business. So first and foremost, they have to really concentrate on themselves, making sure that they're available, can do the things that they need to do. And I'm sure David will talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, who, who, who are some of the, the people in your organization that makes things go? Um, if in sometimes sad to say, but if a key person in your organization stepped off the curb tomorrow and got hit by a bus, how does that affect your business? It's real. We have to consider those types of things. Yeah. As a business owner, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but typically it's going to be either your assistant or your office manager type position. And then maybe one or two of your key sales people, uh, cause you know, I, if without them, they're the core, nothing works. The owner's got to take on the extra slack. So is that, is that pretty typical? Yeah, very typical. And, and they get into a cycle. So business owners can get into a cycle. So when they lose a key employee, what happens is that they get drawn back into the day-to-day working in your business, not on your business. So when does that stop? Does it stop at a certain revenue? Does it stop at a certain um, employee size? The CEO can only do so much and they need to be doing CEO stuff. And if a key employee leaves and they get pulled back into that position, now that cycle, they just continue to grind. That cycle never stops. Losing revenue too, usually at that point. You're losing revenue. You're hemorrhaging all over the place. And again, you're not moving the business forward. So great point. So how would you guys define a key employee and what qualities does this person have? Well, I think, uh, First and foremost, someone who, if they left the business or if they were no longer in your business, someone who would have a tremendous impact financially on you. Yeah. Um, I I think, Luke, you hit it right. A lot of your top sales guys, those relationships, if the business owner doesn't have those relationships, if it's the key employee that has those or the sales guy that has those relationships, especially if he's going off to start his own company or going to a competitor in a similar field, uh, those relationships are probably going to follow him. So somebody that has key relationships or would have a tremendous impact on you financially if they were no longer affiliated with you and your organization. Yeah, and I think that's hard cost and soft cost, right? Because you can look at it and go, okay, this salesperson makes a, you know, generates a hundred thousand dollars of revenue every year. If I lost them, I'd lose a hundred thousand. Uh, but your assistant only makes thirty five grand a year. Well, if I lost her, I'd have thirty. No, that's not how it works. How much is your time worth? And now you're spending an extra twenty hours a week doing the stuff that that thirty five thousand dollar year employee should be doing, uh, or that you know eighteen twenty dollar an hour employee. And, and it's taken away from some big revenue that you could be making. Yeah, you know, because owners are typically in the hundreds or thousands of dollars per hour when you look at what they actually help generate. So if you look, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Well, so so an exercise that that we have business owners do is just take each employee and say, just take them away, just take them away. And then what's the fallout? So like you guys say in the soft cost. So if somebody, you know, a key administrator, you may not, they may not make the top down in the office, but what do they affect in the office and the, and the administrative and the paperwork and all that type of thing, take them away, kind of sketch out. It's not going to be perfect, but sketch out what they, how they impact the business and then start to realize 
where everything is. So that, again, that's just an, an eye exercise. opener right there. Absolutely. That's an exercise that would definitely bring some light to people. Well, and I think one of the most, uh, you know, it's a soft cost, I guess, but it's hard to put a value to it is just morale of your team. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we onboarded an employee earlier this year and it was a, it was a very short stint and it didn't go well and morale was affected by it. Just it, they were only there for three or four months, but everybody was kind of like, oh, that was, man, that was rough. That was a rough few months because they, they weren't meeting our cultural standards. Well, it, so I have a client that actually kind of to your point of the it doesn't just have to be a salesperson. I have a client that has three locations in Lansing and two on the east side of the state metro Detroit area. And he has one gal that runs those two office locations. She's technically just an office manager, quote unquote. Right. But if in our conversation with him, if she was no longer there, if she left the organization to go do something similar or even just anywhere else, he has he now has transportation costs. He has to be out there because at this point he only has to be out there three, four, five times a month. Right. And if she's no longer there, that's five to that that three, four, five times a month goes to ten to fifteen. Yep. No, I, I just had a client who uh, owned four locations. All, they're pretty spread out to like two and a half hours away, two in the Lansing area, two and a half hours away in Michigan. And um, he could not find a manager for one of his locations. And he tried for five years. For five years, he drove twice a week, two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back. It's on the west side of the state, which gets hit with heavy snowfall. He was so relieved when he got bought out because he never could find somebody to fill that position and now it's somebody else's he, he redeemed a ton of time you know that's what 10 hours a week that he redeemed just by getting rid of that location so i'm, I'm on board with you on that one so all right let's talk about so we, we know how we know what in a key employee is how do we protect them how do we keep them in so i'll start because i started out with the story which is actually about my co-host eric and uh, Eric never seriously pursued leaving the Mardigan agency, but he knew and I knew that he had the talent to go start his own agency. And he was key to our morale. Um, he's our key salesperson. He's now a sales manager type role. And um, what I realized very quickly was keeping him where he was was the worst decision I could make. The number one thing that I needed to do was give him more ownership. And so uh, what did that look like for you, Eric? And why did that have such an impact? Well, when you have uh, more ownership, as you say, it actually makes accountability higher. And for you and I, with our old professions, military and law enforcement, <clears throat> we actually prefer accountability. And accountability actually drives success for me. Um, without accountability, I don't know if action can be taken as well. Um, I think that's pretty clear. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I have ideas as well, and bringing those to the table is helpful for the team. Yep. Um, empowering me is beneficial for the whole team, obviously, because two people bearing one load versus just one person bearing the whole load, I think makes it a way more successful and healthy work environment. Absolutely. And, and at least what I've seen is you thrived, right? So like we I actually gave you more to do and you are more productive now with more on your plate than you were before with just your sales kind of sales role on your plate. Um, and so you're more productive and then the sales team sees you be more productive and it just becomes this, you know, to use a catchphrase, synergistic reaction of uh, everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really powerful. Uh, one of the pieces that we put into place, uh, we're, we're making sure that if something were to happen to Eric, other than him leaving uh, voluntarily, but maybe him leaving involuntarily, like getting hit by a bus. David, can you speak to that? Uh, absolutely. I have a, a client who, um, three owners, so what Tom was talking about, the key, most key uh, people in your organization are the owners. Yeah. Three owners, um, and one of them unfortunately passed away right before I got to them, about two months before I even met them. And they didn't, they were in a growth spurt. They were a great company, growing fast, had a great game plan on how to do that. And losing the owner, they lost that, that person's uh, intelligence, their knowledge, their their day-to-day -day operations of what they were doing. But yet they didn't have anything in place to help buy that person out. So now they are carrying his wife, who has no expertise in the business, has no help to the business at all uh, from a, from that standpoint, but they have to give her the financial <coughs> Uh, incentives and that the owner was that they had to carry with the original to maintain yeah. that and, lifestyle. And, yeah. So, and, and what you're referring to is t typically in like if you're an LLC, it's in your operating agreement, or if you're a corporation, that it's in your articles of incorporation that's, that dictate that if somebody 
passes away, that that interest passes on to their spouse, or sometimes it mandates that the business buy them out. And there's there's a number of different ways to set up buy sells. Talk to a good attorney, and they'll help you with that. Um, but in this case, they're stuck with a wife that maybe they didn't want to be in business with, and even if they liked her, probably wasn't the best person for that position. Uh, yeah, she was not a good person at all because she couldn't help the organization at all. She has no clue what right. what the business does, how to do, how to step in and fill her husband's role. So. A simple, really, a term life insurance policy at a minimum would have been a great benefit. Right. They would have gotten an influx of cash right away. It would have been able to buy out the wife. Everybody goes away, walks away happy in the business. It slowed. It actually slowed down. He said, I, this is three or four years ago, but I was talking to the owner about a year ago. He said it actually had an impact on us for about a year and a half. So wow. that's that's how much time it took for them to recover from the loss of just one owner. So, all right, so you're talking about somebody passing away suddenly what if you know i i have clients who um it was uh, three people in the partnership and one of the partners ended up going into heart failure and having a heart transplant and in that instance she just didn't work for almost six months so is there anything that our, our listeners can do to help with that situation yeah disability insurance is is uh, something that isn't talked about near as much and we and we have life insurance awareness month everybody knows that life insurance is talked about constantly disability insurance you're actually twice as likely to need Right. Uh, you're more likely to miss work for 90 days or longer, uh, be twice as likely to do that between age 30 and 65 than you are to pass away. Yep. And the great part about disability policies is the price for the return of premiums are nominally more than just buying a regular disability policy. So worst case scenario, you walk away with some cash at the end of your career. Correct. Uh, it's a pretty good deal. Is that helping the other partners? The disability insurance? Yeah, so there's two ways to set it up. Typically, you get two policies, and David, correct me if you do it differently, but the, you have the individual buy one so they can pay their bills if they're mm -hmm. disabled, and then you have the business buy one, and that pays the business what that employee could have brought worth. in. Yeah. Yep. It essentially allows the a business to replace that person's salary and go hire somebody yes. either temporarily or permanently. Yep. And it doesn't take that. It doesn't take extra money out of the cash flow of the business. It allows the money to stay in the business to keep growing and, yep. and, and stay on track. And insurance pays for that transition period rather than your pocketbook. Is there something with a keyholder life insurance policy that would be really a good reason for an employee to stay with the business, Luke? Yeah, David, could you speak to that? So I, I believe we're talking about using a life insurance policy as a way to accumulate cash. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, golden handcuffs is how I've put it. Well, there's, that there's sounds a, pretty cool. It's everybody everybody loves the, the golden handcuffs part, but there's actually multiple uh, stages of it. You can it there's there's a, a way to do it. What I call wooden handcuffs, which isn't actually doesn't strongly tie a key employee to the business. It more loosely does, but it's a little bit less expensive. A little bit doesn't it have to involve an attorney near as much. So it's a kind of an easy fix. Of uh, I have a couple of clients that just say, hey, you know, I'd like to do this for as long as they're here. If they leave, it's not. It, but they control the policy in the uh, deferred compensation or golden handcuff arrangement where the car corporation owns the policy and it accumulates cash, <coughs> the corporation owns it, and so they can use that cash for whatever is necessary. But you put in a situation where, Luke, I really like you. Uh, I want you to stick around, work for me. If you're here in 10 years, I'm going to give you $100,000 or $200,000, whatever it yep. is, just as a bonus. I need a way to fund that in the future. Yep. So I can cover both ends of the spectrum by having a life insurance policy. If you die, I can make sure that my I can I can hire somebody to replace you that doesn't in fact cash impact cash flow. And then I also can accumulate cash inside of it that will allow me to be able to pay you what I'm promising you in the future as well. Yeah. So why wouldn't I just use like my SEP for that? Uh SEP IRAs, you have to use uh yeah, what you do in a in, in a qualified plan. You, what you do for one person, you have to do for everybody. So the hmm, really cool thing about using a life insurance policy is that it doesn't, it allows you to or get around those ERISA rules and do something special, unique, and different for just select people, whether it's your your C-suite of, uh, of your organization, salespeople, top people. You can do something different. You can have a different plan for everybody yep. in your organization. And, and you can access it before 59 and a half, which I think is a huge value anytime <laughs> you're talking about saving for life insurance, especially with our, you know, our generation, you know, I'm right in the bubble of millennial and yep. uh, Gen X, but man, we work so that we can live. We don't live to work. Um, and that's really the key there is I want to be able to retire when I'm 55 and live my life. Absolutely. I will say one more thing to, uh, the, nobody loves to buy life insurance, but what the reason they do use life insurance is one, it helps evade the ERISA rules. And number two, it's a really tax friendly way to do it. It sure is very tax advantage. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening today. We're talking about key employees and uh, Tom, how can our listeners connect with you if they want to know more about coaching? You can reach me uh, website, uh, advocate.com backslash 
T Hamp, and then my number is five one seven five nine nine twenty seven eighty two. And David. Uh, David dot McNeely at Castle Financial Partners dot com uh, or just call me at five one seven three three one eight three three one. And Eric, how about you? Yeah, you can link up with me on Instagram with Eric Farm Bureau, or you can look me up on Facebook, Eric Stephen Gastring. Obviously, reach out and follow the Mardigan Agency on Facebook and Instagram. Absolutely. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on Be Insured.